Oh, you just admitted everyone, so. Okay, we just let everybody in. <laughs> well, hello everybody, welcome. My name is Julio Guato. I am an economics professor at St. Francis College. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of my colleague, uh, Dr. Olivia Bulli Matos, who is actually the advisor of the uh, Students Economics Club uh, at St. Francis College here in Brooklyn, New York. And this is an event of the Economic Society. We are extremely happy to have uh, Robert Hackett with us today. Uh, he is a law and finance professor at Cornell University, respectively at Cornell. And, uh, and also he teaches finance at uh, Georgetown uh, McDonald uh, School of Business. And uh, he's a senior counsel with uh, Westwood Capital, uh, a member of the advisory board of several important institutions. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, Robert has worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is the bank of the Fed, the largest uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank ever. And also he worked for the IMF, for the International Monetary Fund. He has a rich experience in the fields of finance, economics, uh, monetary policy, law. And he shares his views regularly in columns in The Hill and in Forbes magazine. Lately, uh, Robert has been proposing a, a very ambitious program of economic transformation for this country, for the United States, uh, which he calls uh, Invest America, the Invest America plan. And it is a plan, so it's not pie in the sky. Uh, Robert has worked hard on fleshing out his strategic vision with detailed description of institutional structures and mechanisms to make this vision reality. So uh, uh, I think he's a very strong advocate of this kind of programs, which are perhaps inspired in the FDR New Deal. So here's Robert, Rock, uh, Robert Hockett, everybody. Great, well, thank you so much, uh, Julio. And, and thank you guys for um, inviting me in and, and uh, letting, me part of, letting me be part of your, um, your, your group today. Um, this is uh, a great privilege, a great joy, um, and I'm fully cognizant of the honor uh, that it is. So I guess what I'll, I'll do is I'll just say a little bit about maybe the, <clears throat> excuse me, the motivating considerations uh, that kind of entered into or sort of uh, underlay this particular plan or proposal. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about the proposal itself, the, the, the particular parts of it. It kind of comes in four parts. Um, and then we can just sort of open it up to give and take because I'm, I'm reckoning I'm going to learn a lot more from you guys than you'll ever uh, learn from me, given how far along you are in your uh, in your uh, professional lives. Um, so first on the sort of animating considerations. Um, so you can sort of say you can sort of think in terms of maybe uh, a number of sort of shorter term considerations or sort of recently emerged uh, or emergent considerations on the one hand. Uh, and some somewhat longer term considerations on the other. Uh, the shorter term ones are kind of obvious. They're sort of all over the news, right? There's a, a great deal of interest at the moment uh, in what it's going to take, um, not only to sort of bring this country and similarly situated countries uh, out of the pandemic and the sort of associated uh, macroeconomic uh, crises that have sort of grown out of or uh, been exacerbated by, by the pandemic. Um, but there's also uh, an interest um, in sort of addressing certain underlying structural problems uh, that many seem to agree uh, have played a role in rendering some modern polities and certainly this modern polity uh, more vulnerable uh, to pandemic and to the kinds of macroeconomic uh, sequelae that can follow uh, upon a, a pandemic. So there's a, a kind of an ongoing, a very salient uh, interest in both immediate uh, pandemic mitigation measures and on the one hand, uh, and in sort of longer term structural reforms um, that the pandemic has just made all the more obvious to uh, more obviously necessary uh, even though they were kind of obviously necessary even before the pandemic. Uh, on the other hand, um, this uh, this this is sort of one set of sort of recent uh, considerations, you might say, or relatively recent considerations that sort of underlay the plan. Uh, another set that's sort of closely related of, of recent uh, considerations are just the recognition, the growing recognition that the planet is in significant danger of, of non-survival um, if present uh, use, uh, if present trends in the use of carbon emitting uh, fuel sources and power sources 
uh, doesn't change, right? So I'm, I'm essentially alluding uh, to the Green New Deal here, uh, or alternatively to uh, President Biden's uh, Building Back Better uh, platform, which I personally tend to think is basically the Green New Deal ingeniously rebranded. Um, it's essentially the same ambition, it seems, that underlies uh, both uh, programs, so to speak, um, to the point where it really seems like there's one program envisaged and it's just named differently depending on um, whether you're a so-called moderate Democrat or a, a so-called uh, progressive uh, Democrat. So those concerns are sort of recent concerns too, or at least recently become salient concerns that were sort of you know, emerging in the year or two before the pandemic uh, began. And so in that sense, the pandemic simply you know, underscored or accentuated, um, I think a kind of a dawning realization that was sort of spreading pretty quickly and pretty widely even before the pandemic. Um, when it comes to sort of longer uh, term uh, considerations, or at least what I think of as longer term considerations, um, if you look at um, the American economy in particular, uh, over the last 40 uh, to 50 years, uh, you see certain trends that are kind of alarming. Uh, and it seems to me that a lot of these trends are assignable to or traceable from a, a, a common source, a sort of intellectual error uh, that has then been manifest in, in, in policy errors. So I'm alluding on the one hand, of course, to uh, steadily worsening uh, wealth and income uh, inequality uh, across uh, the American economy. Um, but I'm also alluding on the other hand to something that seems to have played um, at least one uh, causal role, or at least to have been one of the causes or causative elements uh, in that, uh, that worsening inequality. Um, uh, and that is essentially a hollowing out uh, of the nation's industrial base and of its productive capacities, right? The, the transformation <clears throat> of the economy into a much more sort of so-called service-based um, and in particular, you know, kind of burger flipping uh, sort of economy and away from uh, being an economy that actually makes things and improves the material uh, lives uh, of the citizenry. Um, so that sort of long-term, you can think of it as a, a kind of a, a version of secular stagnation. You can think of it a, as a version of deindustrialization that then issues in um, a widening of wealth and income gaps uh, in as much as uh, the industrial professions tended to be higher paying thanks to union gains that were made in the 20th century uh, than in the service uh, professions. You can think of these things as all sort of linked together, but it's it basically that kind of longer term malaise uh, in what we might think of as the productive side of the American economy uh, to which has corresponded and to which has been sort of related symbiotically a kind of financialization uh, of the economy, right? And, um, in quite a bit of the work that I've done, and I'm sure a lot of the work that you guys have done, um, I spend a fair bit of time kind of looking at this, this sort of symbiosis between financialization and deindustrialization in the sense that, you know, each of these two identified trends seem to be mutually reinforcing, right? One sort of partly causes another, then the other feeds back into further causing of the, uh, of the original. And this, you get this kind of, again, symbiotic process, this kind of spiraling process. Um, so, so that's uh, been a kind of a longer term dysfunction that's been underway. And it seems to me that that dysfunction itself uh, which is a sort of policy dysfunction, or you can think of it as the upshot of policy dysfunctions, are themselves sort of traceable uh, to what I referred to a moment ago as a kind of intellectual dysfunction or kind of intellectual error. Uh, and that is the error, I think, of considering or thinking about development, national development or economic development, development um, for, as a sort of policy matter, um, as a kind of a one-off achievement, right, whereby uh, a society begins as undeveloped and then it develops and now it's good, right? All good, we're developed now, you know, done, you know, been there, done that, done deal. Um, this particular conception of development, it's very tempting, I find it at least very tempting to trace it uh, really to the Cold War, right? Um, because what, what was going on, of course, as you guys know from, from, from reading, not from experience, everybody's probably too young uh, to have memories of this, but you know, over the course of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and even pretty well into the 80s, um, you know, the United States as a polity seemed to conceive itself as being in a kind of competition 
uh, with the so-called Soviet bloc for influence over and goodwill on the part of the so-called developing world or the so-called underdeveloped countries or the so-called third world. Um, and that, that fact, right, the fact of that sort of perceived competition, that sort of perceived national mission as being about, you know, beating out the Soviets for influence in the underdeveloped world seems to have had ramifications in the American Academy, which wouldn't be surprising, to the point where lots of economists who began thinking of themselves as development economists thought of the project of development as simply, you know, modernizing once and for all uh, these client states, right? These so-called third world or underdeveloped countries to sort of, you know, catapult them into developed status so that they wouldn't be vulnerable uh, to the blandishments of the Soviet side. So they wouldn't find uh, Soviet um, uh, suites uh, that were sort of dangled before them as being attractive, right? And it's tempting for me to think that this is, this is sort of how to understand why it was or how it came to pass that American development economists thought of development then as a sort of a, a, a task that you sort of do one time, you know, you start again undeveloped and then you become developed. But if you think about it, that's a really strange idea of development. Um, if you think about it, um, you know, one, if you, if you look sort of under the hood uh, of development itself, even as conceived by what I think of as these short-sighted development economists of the 60s and 70s, whom we tend to, so we sort of, you can sort of think of as maybe having been um, uh, part of a family that began with Walt Rostow, who was, you know, an early so-called development economist, but whose posting was in, interestingly enough, the National Security a Agency of the, or National Security Council uh, of the U.S., right, rather than in an economics department. Anyway, um, if you look under the hood of what these people thought of as development, well, it's pretty clear that they were thinking at least subconsciously of technological advancement. Uh, and once you recognize that, then you, all you have to do is remind yourself of one other thing to see that development can't possibly be plausibly viewed as a one-off achievement. And that's that technology itself is continually changing, continually progressing, right? So that the technologies of 10 years ago look kind of quaint and archaic uh, even today, right? I mean, here's just an example I'll pull right out of the hat, just out of one of this morning's headlines, right? There's, a, I think it's a headline in the, in the FT today, maybe it was yesterday, um, or maybe it was Reuters, but in any event, it was an entire newspaper article devoted to the fact that the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, uses a flip phone, right? He, he hasn't moved to the iPhone yet, right? So he's still using one of these flip phones that were sort of common up until about 2007 or 2008. Um, and what that tells you, of course, is that, you know, a technology that was sort of state of the art 12, 13, 14 years ago, seems kind of ridiculous now. It's as though he were traveling by horse and buggy rather than by automobile. Um, and this is just, you know, again, an example just pulled out of my hat or out of the headlines today or yesterday. Um, but the, the point is fairly obvious, I assume, right? Technology is itself constantly developing, constantly renewing. Um, and development accordingly, if we think of development as the task of sort of accommodating new technologies, uh, and sort of smoothening the process by which new technologies kind of propagate throughout an entire economy, then it's fairly clear that development has to be thought of as a continuous kind of lifelong process, that basically an economy we want to be developing continually for as long as there is such a thing called an economy or the economy. And what that means in turn is that the only real question is to what extent do we have to use or engage in collective action to sort of optimize that accommodation and propagation process? And to what extent can we leave that accommodation and propagation to market forces or private ordering? And you guys have enough economic background uh, to sort of be able to see right off the bat that while there's plenty that can be left to private ordering here, there's also plenty that, that can't, right? There are all sorts of collective action and coordination challenges that stand in the way of a sort of optimal accommodation. And so in a certain sense, the, the sort of proverbial Aristotelian golden mean here would be 
uh, to sort of identify, to be able to identify um, those areas or those particular processes that require some sort of collective um, assistance uh, or facilitation and those that don't. And then to develop means of doing that facilitating that on the one hand do indeed succeed in facilitation while not on the other hand, quote unquote, picking winners and losers uh, in, a, in a sort of not foresightful way or in a, in a sort of an unwise or sort of idiotic way. Now, history, of course, is rife uh, with examples of collective action used in order to facilitate a kind of optimal and rapid propagation of promising technologies of tomorrow. Um, so for example, uh, in the US, even long after it became clear um, about a, a little over a hundred years ago, that petroleum was a superior, was going to be a superior primary energy source to coal. Petroleum was not very quick in replacing coal until the United States Navy and then the United States Armed Forces more broadly basically started making massive orders for conversion of their own infrastructures to use petroleum because it was so much easier to refuel uh, battleships and aircraft carriers and the like with petroleum than it was with coal. Um, and once sort of major uh, basic, you know, major procurement decisions of this kind were being made by the federal government or by its instrumentalities, this in effect basically nudged the economy as a whole into sort of moving from coal to petroleum, which although a backward uh, fueling technology now was you know, state of the art or cutting edge uh, about a century ago. Um, an easy example to sort of raise for the, the contemporary moment, right? The present moment is that, you know, if we've decided that electric cars, electric automobiles are environmentally superior uh, to fossil fuel uh, burning automobiles, well, sure, uh, private sector companies or manufacturers can manufacture these automobiles, Tesla being a case in point, which at this point, as of today, has the world's largest market cap. And so it would be foolish to say that, oh, the private sector isn't capable of doing anything here. But if you ask yourselves, you know, what sorts of things might speed up the uptake of electric vehicles? Well, one, I would think, would be to have electric charging ports at every parking meter or parking place in every urban area. And Tesla uh, and battery companies simply don't have the jurisdiction to go and install those in every parking place in every urban area. Urban governments have to make that decision. And then further actions have to be taken to facilitate the installation of that kind of infrastructure in urban areas. And if that happens, that will presumably speed up or basically expand the market for these automobiles quite rapidly. And it seems to me that examples like this, again, can be sort of proliferated with abandon. And what they all have in common is they, they all, in a sense, highlight the need for some kind of coordination and some sort of collaborative relation between public sector authority on the one hand and private sector agency on the other hand, in order again, to sort of smooth it and optimize that sort of accommodation and propagation process throughout an economy as technologies develop, as they progress. And it seems to me that that in effect is what national development is, right? If you needed a kind of reductive or shorthand definition or description of what development would be, it would be that, uh, and if we understand it that way, then we see immediately that there needs or has to be a sort of public-private co collaboration uh, here. Now, here's the next um, sort of related consideration uh, that prompts the plan, and then I'll get to the plan itself. Uh, it seems that the United States or American policymakers and intellectuals alike used to understand this, right? I mean, before the Cold War period in particular, this seems to have been something of a commonplace, right? Indeed, um, one of those uh, 18th century dead white men who's counted as one of the American founders and perhaps the most ingenious of the American founders uh, was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and this is essentially what Hamilton is known for, right? The sort of Hamiltonian development vision is the thing, it's precisely the thing that most of those who most admire Hamilton to this day, 
know him for and admire him for. He was quite brilliant in other respects as well, much of American jurisprudence, much of the doctrine laid down by the Supreme Court in the early days of this republic, basically stemmed from uh, Alexander Hamilton's brilliance as a legal theorist and as a legal thinker and as a constitutional theorist. And he was you know, particularly well situated to be a constitutional theorist, having drafted a good bit of our constitution itself. But quite apart from all of that sort of constitutional law side of his person, and quite apart from his prowess as a sort of political theorist, was his prowess as a kind of active economic theorist. And when you think about it, the even the distinction between those two things, even my sort of separately naming his political theoretic prowess on the one hand and his economic or practical or applied economic prowess on the other is two distinct things. That is itself a, a kind of an oddly, an idiosyncratically modern, or it reflects an idiosyncratic, in the idiosyncratically modern way of thinking of polity on the one hand, and economy on the other. As you guys know, back in the 18th century, we didn't even talk about economics. We spoke of political economy. That hyphen itself sort of suggested that we tended to think of polity and economy as sort of linked. And indeed, the, you know, the, the actual etymology of the phrase political economy itself, itself is revelatory of the fact that we used to think organically about these two things as one. Uh, and that's, as you, as you guys know, the ancient Greek meaning of the word economy, right? The, the word from which um, the English word economy derives basically had a meaning roughly equivalent to today's uh, term or phrase, home economics, right? It was basically economics or economy was about household management uh, in the ancient Greek uh, conception of the term economy. Uh, and so when the, 18th, when the early so-called political economists of the 18th century adopted the phrase or coined the term political economy, what they were referring to then was sort of the domestic management of a polity, right? The sort of household or sort of domestic or home economics where the home was a polity, right? So we were talking about then the management of the polity's material affairs. And that sort of intellectual backdrop itself, I think played a role in Hamilton's becoming the person that he was and the intellect that he was. He viewed, right, the public sector or the federal government as something that was a sort of essential agent in the development process and he viewed the development process as something that had to be collectively seized and taken ownership of and then facilitated partly for reasons of national survival itself, right? He understood that to be a great power that wasn't simply going to be taken over or dismembered or recolonized by already largely developed European polities, either by the UK again, or by France, uh, or perhaps by some other European polity, he understood that, well, we basically had to jumpstart our own growth, our own domestic manufacturing capacity, our own basically capacity to become what he would himself refer to as a great commercial republic. So commercial republics on Hamilton's view and on the view of many of the Federalists, which was the party to which he belonged, was a, a kind of um, a, a, an exercise of collective agency, uh, an exercise of agency on the part of the polity as a sort of single entity, as a kind of organic whole, to sort of take charge of its own future and take charge of its own capacity development. Uh, and all of these great state reports that he wrote up then as the treasury secretary, report on manufacturers, report on the public credit, report on a public bank uh, or on a national bank, were all basically animated by that vision. Now he didn't invent it out of whole cloth, of course. Um, he derived it largely from a couple of sources. One was the great French economist, uh, Colbert. Uh, another was the great Scottish financier who happened to be a functionary of the French state. Uh, that was of course, John Law. Uh, and then finally, another was the great French uh, financial statesman, both of the Ancien Regime and of the early Napoleonic regime, uh, Jacques Necker. Um, and as some of you might know, Hamilton's mother was, was herself French or Francophone. So Hamilton was at home in French as he was in English. And so there's a lot of sort of French dirigisme or the sort of the French tradition of dirigisme that was part of Hamilton's intellectual composition. But what's sort of more interesting for our purposes 
is that Hamilton, as the sort of state-of-the-art version of this way of thinking circa 1790 or so, ended up becoming enormously influential worldwide, right? So when Germany or when the German uh, statelets uh, finally found themselves unifying in the mid to late 19th century and realized that they were going to have to sort of economically jumpstart and develop themselves, um, the person who became the architect of this, Friedrich Liszt, uh, was himself a Hamiltonian and said so by name, right? So he basically took what Hamilton's so-called American plan, renamed it the national plan so that it could be pursued in Germany uh, and referred to it, said that it was Hamiltonian. He cited Hamilton. That became in a sense, the blueprint for the great German miracle or the great German modernization. A few decades later, when Meiji Japan uh, was visited by Commodore Perry's so-called black ships, these steamships from the American Navy that forced their way uh, into uh, near, near to Edo or into Tokyo Harbor, um, the Meiji Japanese thought, oh, we better jumpstart and grow and become modern and able quickly. Uh, they adopted the plan uh, from Least uh, and themselves referred to it as Hamiltonian as well as Leastian. <laughs> And then of course, as you guys know, uh, most of the East Asian tiger economies then followed the same script, oftentimes themselves citing Hamilton as a sort of progenitor. Uh, and what's sort of intriguing is that that means that by the time we get to you know, the 1950s, 1960s, pretty much all of the world that's developing, uh, or at least most countries in the world that had sort of managed to develop themselves without um, some, you know, uh, Washington consensus consultants coming in uh, and telling them how to do it, uh, were referring to themselves as Hamiltonians. And ironically, the one country or the one developed country that no longer was being Hamiltonian was Hamilton's country, uh, the United States. So um, one way then to view uh, the plan that I'm about to sort of elaborate is as a sort of recovered Hamiltonianism, a sort of a recovered or recouped Hamiltonian vision to sort of reclaim agency in our own development. But now with this understanding, a more explicit understanding that development doesn't mean just you know, moving from undeveloped to developed, it means constancy, it means continually. Um, I'll sum up that vision with um, a sort of a, a flip, a sort of a, a flippant sort of quote. Um, I sometimes like to think of Bob Dylan as being in a certain sense, the greatest development economist of the modern era, um, just because of one line in one song, right? So any of you who have ever heard the old, it's one, I'm one of those people who likes the early Dylan more than the late Dylan, I think most people do. But so one of those very early songs from before I was born um, has this, this unbelievably wonderful potent line in it. Um, and it's, he not busy being born is busy dying. Um, and it seems to me that that's true of all of us as individuals, but I think it's also true of a polity or of an economy. There are a lot of ways in which it's false or it's a, a sort of, uh, you can think of it as, an, uh, as a fallacy of composition to assimilate a polity to a household or a country to a person. But there's some ways, there's some particular spheres or respects in which you can I think legitimately compare uh, an economy or a polity to a household or to a person. And I think development is, is one of those. You can think of an economy as something that develops forever, that it's, con it's a lifelong process development. Just as we like to think that the ideal human life is one in which the human being who's living it is constantly growing and developing and learning and so forth. So you can think of this as sort of lifelong education for a polity, um, or you can think of it as Bob Dylan development uh, or Dylanian development um, that is sort of it's a continuous process. Now, all of that being laid out then as sort of backdrop, as sort of the intellectual backdrop on the one hand and the kind of, I don't know, sort of political crisis backdrop on the other hand, all of that sort of being laid out. The next question is, all right, well, how might the United States recover its own Hamiltonian tradition, right? What might that look like? Well, the a, a sort of meta, or how should I put it, a, a kind of a guiding concern, let's say, in trying to envisage how we might do this in my case, has been, you know, to look for existing institutions that might be tweaked or sort of marginally adjusted in such a way as nevertheless to bring about quite transformative results. In other words, uh, chaitaris paribus, right? All else being equal, if you can accomplish an end effectively with existing institutions, 
simply by tweaking them or improving them a bit by you know, turning a few screws uh, or adjusting a few levers rather than establishing or attempting to establish an altogether new institution out of whole cloth, then that might be the best way to operate because it's probably going to present you with a path of least resistance. In other words, it might be a little bit easier uh, to get our own Congress to agree uh, to adding or adjusting a few functionalities that are possessed or could be possessed by existing institutions than it would be to establish an altogether new institution. And so the plan that, that I've sort of put forth, this Invest America plan, is also sort of animated by that sort of desideratum, right? By that particular uh, working hypothesis that it's probably easier uh, to get what you want if you adjust what you have rather than just establishing something new. I don't mean to be dogmatic about that. I might be completely wrong. I might simply be wrong in that expectation. Um, but it seems to me that it's probably right. And so that's the reason I've sort of imagined things along those lines. So here then is that plan, right? Here are the sort of four planks. And what I'll do is I'll emphasize in connection with each one, the sense in which what it is doing is basically adding a functionality to or optimizing through a kind of tweaking certain existing institutions. So to begin with then, right, the first um, element or plank of the plan, as you guys have probably seen, is this entity I'm proposing uh, called the National Reconstruction and Development Council or NRDC, right? Now the NRDC has the advantage of both using stuff that we already have and also having analogs that we already have that are sort of very easy uh, to draw attention to in order to sort of draw out the compellingness of an institution of this sort. So what we already have is a presidential administration, which includes a cabinet of cabinet officials. Each cabinet official is the head of the director or the uh, chairperson of some existing federal instrumentality that has jurisdiction over one or another of the nation's primary infrastructures or industries, right? So there's a federal communications commission which has charge of and jurisdiction over all of the nation's communications infrastructure, including you know, television, radio, cable, other forms of communication. The Department of Transportation is another such entity, another federal agency that has jurisdiction over all of the nation's transportation infrastructures, right? That means roads, railroads, waterways, other uh, modes. There is a separate um, uh, airline uh, authority or air traffic uh, authority that works in close, in close conjunction with the DOT, the Department of Transportation. But basically you see where this is going. Most of the principal infrastructures are overseen by a cabinet level agency. And similarly, we have regulatory agencies that have oversight authority with respect to some of the principal or most of the principal industries of the country, in addition to the infrastructures, right? The steel industry, the automotive industry, other sort of major components of the nation's industrial base are all sort of overseen by cabinet level agencies. But what is interesting is that there is no, there is presently no established structure through which these multiple cabinet level agencies meet or coordinate or do any kind of planning. And that in turn is itself, I think, a reflection of this fact that we think of development as something that just, it's already done or insofar as it continues to happen, it's just a private sector thing. We just leave it to private ordering. We don't act in any sort of proactive way to try to shape it or to hasten it or speed it up or optimize it, right? In the way that let's say Japan's Ministry of Trade and Industry or METI does, right? Uh, and so since we don't see developments that way, it doesn't occur to us to sort of configure our separate agencies in a manner that facilitates coordination and planning among them. But now note, we do understand the need for that kind of thing in certain other spheres of national interest. So for example, we have a National Security Council or NSC, which combines all of the distinct federal agencies that have charge over some piece of the national defense 
structure or the national defense establishment, right? The NSC, in other words, brings together into one sort of planning body, one sort of oversight and planning body, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the procurement offices, uh, all of the defense agencies that contract with private producers or manufacturers of war material or warships or planes or bullets or guns or what have you. All of that stuff is brought together under a single council for sort of obvious reasons, right? It would be rather weird, wouldn't it? If, I mean, you imagine, let's say that the, I don't know, the Department of the Navy uh, has to procure bullets for rifles that Marines uh, use on the one hand and the Department of the Army also has to procure bullets for army rifles, but they're not talking together. They might not even be using the same rifles or maybe they are using the same rifles, but they get separate, you know, different bullets or something. And there might not be then interoperability between systems. It would be absurd and it would be a, a serious threat to national security, not to sort of, you know, render a, a kind of organic whole of these dis disparate parts of the defense establishment. And so we have this National Security Council that brings them together. Similarly, <clears throat> before the financial crash of 2008, we had multiple separate financial regulators, which were sometimes colloquially said to be siloed from one another, meaning that each one was operating within its own sort of piece of the financial system without giving much mind to the interconnections between the silos, right? So the Securities and Exchange Commission nominally would oversee the capital markets, basically the investment banking sector and the investment company, the mutual fund sector. We had three distinct banking regulators that would oversee the banking sector. There was also, there are also 50 distinct state bank regulators that would separately regulate 50 different state chartered banking systems. Uh, there was a separate derivatives market regulator called the Commodity Futures Trading Commission or CFTC. Um, you see where this is going or right? all of these regulators were radically distinct from one another, each one attending to its own piece of the financial system and each one accordingly missing the forest for the trees, right? Failing to see the financial system as a single integrated whole, which turned out to have been a terrible mistake because part of what enabled the dysfunctions that ultimately manifested in the crash of 2008 to continue to develop was precisely the interconnectedness between silos that the individual regulators couldn't see or weren't seeing. And so in the very first title, the very first part of the primary legislative response to the 2008 crash, which as you guys know, was the Dodd-Frank uh, Act of 2010, the very first part of it, the title one, is devoted to the establishment of a so-called financial stability oversight council better known colloquially as the FSOC. And all the FSOC does is pull all of those distinct regulators together into one council that meets on a regular basis uh, with a goal, with a view uh, to developing a vision of the financial system as a whole, and then spotting emerging threats to what is called, quote unquote, the financial stability of the United States which figures as a kind of phrase of art throughout the Dodd-Frank Act. It's repeated continually, the financial stability of the United States, almost as if to drive the point home that this is one thing, it's not 10 things, right? So the FSOC is another uh, case then where we take existing institutions and combine them for a specific purpose into a kind of synergistic whole that we call a council. And this doesn't mean that their individual mandates don't continue. It just means that their individual mandates are now add, sort of supplemented by a shared cross-sectoral mandate that complements right, those individual sectoral mandates. What, the, uh, what, what this new council that I'm proposing then, this National Reconstruction and Development Council would do is the same thing. It would say, yeah, sure, Department of Transportation has its own mandate and its own functions and its own duties and responsibilities. The Federal Communications Commission as well, the Department of Energy as well, every one of these distinct departments. However, if we are as a nation going to take charge sort of proactively of our own development 
as we decided 11 years ago to take charge of our own financial stability, and as we decided even before that to take charge of our own national defense, then we also need these agencies to be coordinating and acting together. And in particular, what they are to do, excuse me, the goal that I set for them is to develop um, as quickly as possible uh, what I refer to as a national development strategy, right? A sort of a single integrated national development strategy, which basically would take the economy as a whole, look at all of the different uh, sectors of the economy and what the likely industries of the future are going to be, or what industries we want to make sure are being adequately capitalized in order to enable to grow and spread. And to do this coherently such that basically enabling or facilitating one new industries growing more rapidly and being adequately capitalized is not in any sense at cross purposes with another industry of the future is doing so. And also to identify the particular regions of the country where this kind of jumpstarted development is especially urgently needed. If we need more broadband, for example, which is ubiquitous throughout the state of California, but if we need more of it in Appalachia or in you know, rural Pennsylvania or in the American West or whatever, to sort of do what we need to do to get it over there as well, right? To get broadband to other places as well. And again, to, when we do that, to do it in a way such that aiding one region of the country in getting this new technology doesn't somehow interfere with some other region of the country's getting some other new technology that it needs. And also such that getting this new technology to Appalachia doesn't prevent other new technologies from coming to Appalachia. You see what I mean? So <clears throat> if we think of development as being inherently cross-sectoral and, <clears throat> and also transcontinental or transnational, or I should say, you know, cross-national, because it is a continent-spanning republic, <clears throat> then we need some kind of coherent oversight and planning if that proactivity is not to be sort of, I don't know, counterproductive activity or retroactivity, right? So the National Development Strategy, which has an analog, by the way, in an annually produced National Defense Posture Statement that the defense agencies put together every year, if we, if we put that together and then regularly update it in the same way that the defense policy statement uh, is, then I think we are in effect providing ourselves with a kind of episteme, a kind of a mind, a, a part of the brain will now be activated, a part of the brain that's currently lying dormant, right? So we can start visualizing what proactive national, continuous national modernization might look like and we can also identify where action is needed and where it's not. And we can identify ways in which to act such that benefiting this industry or this region isn't somehow undercutting this industry or this region, right? So that would be the, the project of the council. Stay, and again, note that it makes use of already existing entities, right? This is just cabinet level agencies, okay? now. Plank two of the plan uh, sort of follows immediately upon uh, plank one. And that is that, well, once you've done the identifying, right, once you've sort of said, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that, blah, blah, blah. Well, now we have to direct funding, right? We have to, we have to do the financing that's necessary to make these things that we've decided have to happen, happen. And directing the financing means on the one hand, directing public capital, but it also perhaps means directing, or at least sort of, if, how should I put it, um, channeling or encouraging private capital to flow in particular areas where it might not be flowing uh, as well. Um, and so in a sense, what we need is a sort of a financial planning body that is the sort of counterpart of the sort of broader development policy planning body that financing body would be kind of coordinate with that broader planning body. In other words, the financing entity would be coordinate with the council. And as it happens, we already have an entity that's very well situated to do this as well. It's just that we have not up to this point 
envisaged this as a possible mandate for it or as a possible uh, mission for it. So I'm alluding uh, to the Federal Financing Bank, which is a financial institution within our Treasury Department. And what the FFB does essentially is to use appropriated monies, congressionally appropriated monies, to extend credit or credit support to the aforementioned agencies that constitute, that will constitute the council, which agencies themselves typically extend credit or credit support to private sector industries in the name of advancing particular projects. Right? That's sort of how the FFB works now, is it finances the operations of these agencies themselves <clears throat> and when these agencies themselves sometimes offer credit or credit supports to help jumpstart industries or to help jumpstart growth in particular uh, regions of the country, the FFB is what does all of that financing. So what I would what I suggest is sort of part two of the plan then is that if we make FFB the financing arm of this newly established NRDC, this newly established council, we should add a couple of functionalities to the FFB itself to sort of, that would basically complement this sort of new set of, func this new sort of overarching functionality that we invest in, um, or that we, that we vest in our uh, currently separate cabinet level agencies. So the tweaks to the FFB that I propose, you can sort of categorize as sort of being at the output or the outflow end and the inflow end, right? Let's start with the inflow end. On the inflow end, what we could do, actually probably better start with the outflow end because that, it makes, makes it clearer why the inflow end changes are needed. So on the outflow end, what if we had the FFB, instead of just offering credit support to our agencies uh, in, in very sort of minimal ways, um, and, and, and sort of reactive ways, right? Basically ways that the agencies themselves determine. What if we actually em <clears throat> empowered the FFB either directly or through the agencies themselves to invest in various sectors of our economy and in various regions of our economy in a broader array of ways, right? Not just making loans and not just making loan guarantees, but maybe entering into public-private partnerships that themselves help to finance new developments uh, in different regions or different industries, and even maybe taking equity stakes in some cases, right? Purchasing ownership shares in some uh, new firms or existing firms, again, in order to sort of facilitate um, a, a much broader array of public investment and public-private investment where it's needed in order to advance the sort of proactive vision that's mapped out in the national development strategy statement that's that's uh, produced and then updated on an annual basis. That would be at the sort of outflow end. And then sort of correspondingly at the inflow end, what if instead of financing the federal financing bank itself only through congressional appropriations, right? Just appropriated funds. What if we also empowered the FFB to establish various special purpose vehicles or SPVs of the kind that are, are, are quite commonplace now in the private sector, which SPVs would basically be kind of like mutual funds that would specialize in investing in various sectors of the American economy. And these SPVs or these funds would invite private capitalization along with public capitalization, right? So you might have, for example, and a, uh, a wind energy fund. So the FFB establishes a special purpose vehicle, just a legal trust that is empowered to issue bond instruments or perhaps hybrid instruments, right? That basically amount on the one hand to a guaranteed return up to a point and then an equity sliver about uh, above that. So you've got something sort of like a convertible bond, something like uh, something that's half, half uh, ownership share, half bond that's issued by, let's say this uh, wind power fund, you can have public funds go into this uh, wind power fund. In other words, the public sector entities can purchase the issuances of this fund. The Fed itself can purchase them, uh, for example. Uh, 
but so can private parties, private investment banks, pension funds, and the like, so that you basically mix public and private capital in these various SPVs, which provide then further funding that the FFB can use then in doing the targeted investing that he does, that, that it does. This would have a couple of, or several, I think, salutary effects. For one thing, of course, it boosts the amount of capital available. For another thing, it offers a more productive outlet for much private capital in search of yield that currently doesn't have any real productive outlet that's consistent with yield, right? At, at present, as you guys know, for private capital, it's a lot easier to make a quick buck simply by gambling on price movements in secondary and tertiary markets. Actual productive investment in the productive economy requires patient capital, uh, oftentimes doesn't yield very high returns, at least not in the short run. And so it ends up being sort of individually rational for lots of private investors just to go and play in the secondary and tertiary markets rather than actually investing patiently in the primary markets. But if you had investment instruments that were offered that off, that are sort of somewhere between somewhere between uh, high yield short term speculative investments on the one hand and longer term lower yield productive investments on the other you would presumably attract some of that capital and that might then siphon away some of the source of financial market volatility right out there in the secondary and tertiary markets and put that money to better use and then finally, we could get a little bit in the way of sort of um, a Hayekian informational uh, benefit out of something like this too, in the sense that if, if particular funds are associated with particular areas or kinds of project, and some of them are attracting more capital than others, that would at least be one data point uh, available to public decision makers as to where investors think most profits are likely to come or what's most likely to succeed. That's not to say that that sort of price signal information should be dispositive or determinative of what we do as a public, uh, but it is to say that it's at least relevant and we'd have a nice easy way of getting that relevant information if we did this. So that's, that's sort of plank two of the plan. A final point I'll make in this connection before moving to three and four, which are much quicker to, to sort of elaborate. Um, is that this particular pairing, uh, this kind of pairing has um, two very interesting precedents uh, in, in our country uh, in the 20th century, right? So when it looked uh, like the US was going to enter into the first world war uh, early in 2017, I mean, sorry, 1917, the Wilson administration thought, gosh, you know, our economy is very productive, but it's not on a war footing, right? We're not producing war material. We're not producing weapons or uniforms or boots for soldiers or uniforms for sailors or you know, guns or what have you. Um, we need to sort of jumpstart production there really quickly. And we need to do it in a way that's sort of coherent across sectors and across regions. And then we also have to finance it. Uh, we need some, some form of financing that sort of combines public and private capital so that the big boost in expenditure on this won't be inflationary. We want to suck some of the private capital out of the private sector and, and direct it into this war production as well. And so we established uh, a war industries board or WIB on the one hand and a war finance corporation or WFC on the other hand. And the WIB can be thought of as a wartime equivalent to the council that is plank one of this plan and the WFC, the War Finance Corporation, can be thought of as an analog to this FFB upgrade uh, that I propose. Next, the very same pairing was replicated 30 years later uh, at the time of the Second World War, when it was clear that the US was going to be partly arming the allies even before entering the war in the Second War. And then it became clear that the US was probably gonna end up uh, entering into the Second World War. Franklin Roosevelt to the Roosevelt administration established a war production board patterned explicitly after the war industries board of the first world war. And the war production board was you know, planning economy wide for second world war production because it was pretty clear that was going to be necessary and would have to be done again coherently and sensibly. Uh, and furthermore, that we would have to jumpstart the production of some things that we didn't didn't produce at all yet at the time, like rubber. Uh, for example. <clears throat> and so the War Production Board became the planning board, and again, hence the analog to the NRDC, the council that I'm proposing now. And then the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC, which basically was just a retread 
of the War Finance Corporation at the First World War was already there because that was established in the early 30s, ironically, just a year after the War Finance Corporation disbanded to address the, uh, the problems of the Great Depression. So the RFC just basically stepped into the shoes of its own predecessor, the War Finance or WFC Corporation, uh, and was the financing arm uh, for this. And the RFC took equity stakes uh, in firms in addition to extending credit and credit support and also finance the building of entirely new plants, entirely new productive facilities, which were then leased to, or just you know, basically given for, for use to private sector firms like General Motors and the like to get them to produce tanks and planes and so forth. So this pairing seems to have a, you know, seems to work rather well. And there's no reason we shouldn't replicate it, but make it a permanent fixture, it seems to me, of our public instrumentalities as long as you know, as soon as we recognize that development is never ending and that furthermore development can be thought of as what the great american philosopher william james would call the moral equivalent of war even when it's not war it's there's the same kind of urgency to it especially if we're talking about rescuing the planet from burning right in other words there's as much national security interest it seems to me in decarbonizing and greenifying as there is in making sure that you're building enough B-29s during the Second World War or enough battleships or whatever, right? Okay, finally, um, the final two planks, three and four, I'll be much, much quicker about. So sorry if I've been sort of tedious uh, thus far. Um, the third plank is, is a little bit more concerned with startup industries than it, and startup companies than it is with infrastructure as such. And that is essentially to restore the Fed, the Federal Reserve System, to its original purpose, which was that of a sort of regional network of development finance institutions, right? So some of you might know the United States was rather late in the game when it came to establishing a central bank. That was partly owing to a fear bordering on paranoia on the part of Amer many Americans and, and their political representatives that a central bank would become a sort of northeastern centric entity, that it would become New York focused, that it would tend to be contribute to the financialization of the economy, to the establishment of a sort of financial elite, to a, a sort of deindustrialization de of the economy in favor of finance, as it happened in the UK and in Spain before it and the Netherlands before it. Um, and a fear that basically financial power would end up being, again, sort of focused up in the Northeast, Philadelphia uh, or, or, or New York or Boston or all three. So in order finally to get a central bank, Northern politicians and Western politicians and Southern politicians had to come to an agreement on some sort of an arrangement. And what they agreed on was a very decentralized central bank, a sort of dispersed central bank. And that dispersal took the following form. The basic idea is we had two tiers, right? One tier was that of the regional district Federal Reserve banks, like the New York Fed, uh, which Julio kindly mentioned to you guys I used to work at. But there were others, right? There's the Boston Fed, the Cleveland Fed, the Richmond Fed, the Atlanta Fed, the Kansas City Fed, the St. Louis Fed, all the way across the country, right? And each of these district banks was charged with overseeing credit availability, adequate, basically adequate credit availability to startup companies and small family farms, all these sort of yeoman industries that we back then, ever since the revolutionary era, had prided ourselves on being miraculous creators of, right? We were not quite Napoleon's slag against the UK, a nation of shopkeepers, but we were a sort of nation of small firms, startup companies and family farms and the like. And it was often difficult to get adequate credit to these smaller entities across the country when most of private sector finance was already concentrated in New York and Philadelphia and to some extent in Boston. So the idea was that you would have these district Federal Reserve Banks all over the country making sure that there was adequate capitalization and, and shorter term and medium, even in some cases, medium term credit available to all of these sort of smaller uh, new newcomer companies. And again, small farms because agriculture was still something like 50% of our economy uh, at the turn of the previous century from the 19th to the 20th. And then the other tier would be an oversight body 
called the Federal Reserve Board, right, the FRB, based in Washington. And what that oversight body would do would, would be with something like what I've said that the council should do relative to the cabinet level agencies. It would make sure that the credit policies pursued say by the Cleveland Fed or the Chicago Fed weren't at cross purposes with the credit policies pursued by the New York Fed or the Richmond Fed, right? It was basically a modulatory body. It was tasked with modulation of national credit aggregates whereas the district Federal Reserve Banks were more allocatively oriented. They were meant to essentially to channel credit to, and they were very explicit about this, um, productive enterprises and away from what they called speculation. And they were entirely comfortable with distinguishing between speculation on the one hand and productive investment on the other. And they weren't unmindful of the fact that at the margin, you can have borderline cases where it's hard to distinguish between mere speculation and productive investment on the other. But they were also mindful of the fact that in most cases you can distinguish between these things. And the whole idea then was for the regional feds to do productive investing, productive credit support. And that was allocative, uh, obviously. And then the Federal Reserve Board would make sure that credit aggregates weren't growing too large and hence adding to inflationary pressures and also make sure that there was adequate credit availability to the district banks themselves so that we didn't have an under uh, dissemination or under uh, allocation uh, of credit nationwide. That was the basic idea. Now, we sort of lost that in the 1930s. And there's a very specific, I think, intellectual failure that's responsible for that. And once we recognize that failing as a failing, seems to me we can open the door to sort of bringing back something like that original Fed. The failing, I think, was this. Um, the, the, the theoretical vision behind the explicitly allocated regional Feds was a version of what you guys have probably heard of before known as the Real Bills Doctrine, right? And, and the Real Bills Doctrine had it that if a central bank only lends on the basis of short-term commercial paper issued by productive enterprises, then you'll never have a problem of inflation or deflation. In other words, you'll never have an over emission or an under emission of bank money or credit money, right? What later came to be generalized as credit money, right? It started as Vixellian bank money, then became Keynesian credit money. The th but the idea was that you'd never have an overage or an underage, so to speak, of such credit money as long as you lent precisely on the basis of short-term commercial paper. Now, that was half true, right? That's to say that if indeed you are extending credit only on the basis of productive activities that are financed by sh the issuance of short-term paper, then yeah, you're, you're going to avoid pr producing inflationary pressure on that account. And you're also going to avoid deflation on that account. And that's all fine. But the mistake was to think that there couldn't be any exogenous sources of inflationary pressure or deflationary pressure, right? And indeed, right, this very argument um, had been, you know, had, had been run through in the early 19th, in the late 18th and early 19th century in a debate between the so-called banking school on the one hand and the currency school on the other. And the great um, English commentator, Henry Thornton, sort of exposed the fallacy of the sort of strong form, let's call it, of the real bills doctrine. But that didn't undercut what we can think of as a weaker form of the real bills doctrine. But first on how that mistake manifested here, when um, the 1920s you know, became the so-called roaring 20s and credit aggregates began to grow enormously in the American economy, inflating a massive Wall Street bubble, the Federal Reserve Board, right, the FRB in, 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 in Washington, because it thought that you can't possibly have an over emission of credit if you're following the real bills doctrine, it didn't do anything to tamp down that credit aggregate. It didn't realize, it, didn't, it wasn't noticing this exogenous inflow of capital from abroad that was helping to inflate a bubble here because the, of course the European economies had been so war-torn by the First World War that investment prospects didn't look as good. It also seems to have been overly confident that adherence to the gold standard would prevent 
an aggregate over issuance of credit. And so it did not act proactively to prevent the inflation of that bubble. And then sort of ironically, it made the same mistake in reverse once that bubble burst and there was a sudden contraction of the money supply. And the Fed board thought, well, real bills doctrine, there's gotta be, there's, there's gotta be enough credit to meet demand because after all, you know, there's always the, the, the Federal Reserve regional banks are always standing ready to monetize short-term commercial paper, completely overlooking the fact that, well, there's kind of no reason for, uh, for local producers to seek credit to do producing if there's been a sudden drainage of purchasing power out of the economy and nobody's going to be buying what they would be producing, right? And so it just kind of did nothing and it let the money supply contract. So what we did in 1935 uh, with the National Bank Act of 1935 was to sort of throw the ba baby out with the bathwater. We said, oh, you know, actually credit modulation is important. So we're going to establish an official federal open market committee and empower the Federal Reserve Board to you know, be much more active when it comes to overseeing or modulating the aggregate credit supply to prevent bubbles of the kind that we saw in the 20s and also to counteract sudden debt deflations of the, of the Irving Fisher variety that we saw right after 1929. But in doing that, it said, and we're just gonna jettison the real bills doctrine. And so the local lending functions of the regional Federal Reserve District banks will basically cease. So in a sense, the way I think a, a, a metaphor is helpful here, if you think about it, getting monetary policy right, you can think of it as being a pair of scissors, right? The scissors only cut if you're using both blades. We can think of one blade as the allocative blade and think of the other blade as the modulatory blade. And what we had before 1935 was all allocation with no modulation. And what we had after 1935 was all modulation with very little allocation, at least not from the Fed but you need both blades of the scissors. So what I'm advocating in plank three of the plan is to restore that sort of real bills doctrine reminiscent short-term lending function, productive non-speculative lending function of the regional Federal Reserve District Banks on the one hand, while retaining that modulatory role of the FOMC and the Federal Reserve Board that we've got kind of right now on the other hand, keep them both, right? Do both of those things. And if we do that, then what we have is development finance nationwide to handle the small businesses, basically the private, you know, sort of adequate public credit or public capital availability to sort of pr smaller private sector entities, business entities on the one hand. And that would then complement the sort of the bigger, bigger scale, sort of more infrastructural and major industry type stuff that the council and the FFB uh, pursuant to planks one and two of the plan would be doing on the other hand. Now, in a certain sense, that's it, right? Planks one through three are kind of, they would be wonderful on their own, right? In fact, any, any one of these planks on, in, its, in its own right would be worth doing. But the synergistic effects of doing all three of those, I think would just be phenomenal. It would be absolutely marvelous. Something, it would, be, we, it would probably bring about kind of non-inflationary national growth at a rate or at a pace that we haven't seen since the late 19th century. We'd be talking about China level growth rates, I think, if we were to do this right, at least given all of the pent up um, um, a sort of demand for new technologies and propagation of new technologies. <clears throat> However, just to sort of tie up, tie up the, put a bow on it. The fourth plank of the plan is not strictly necessary, but I think would be really, really good to do. And you can think of this as sort of operating on the, on let's say the liability side of the public balance sheet, sort of in the way that the first three planks are sort of operating on the asset side of the, of the public balance sheet. If we think sort of loosely of the balance sheet as a consolidated Fed and Treasury balance sheet and just call it the public balance sheet, then you can say planks one through three are sort of on the asset side of that sheet. What's on the liability side? Well, currently on the liability side of the Fed balance sheet is of course dollar bills and the bank account equivalents, right? If you pull a, in other words, the nation's money supply. If you take a dollar bill out of your pocket, you read across the top, you'll see the phrase Federal Reserve Note that abbreviates promissory note. These are liabilities in effect issued by the Fed. And of course the treasury also has a kind of quasi monetary liability that it issues 
these are of course the treasury bills, treasury bonds, treasury notes, right? And by the way, it's, it's no accident, right? That one of the treasury securities that is issued is called a note and the dollar bill is called a federal reserve note also. And similarly, it's not an accident that one of another issuance that the treasury engages in T bills, treasury bills has that word bill in it, just like the word dollar bill issued by the Fed, isn't it? These are both basically, the, these are the principal forms of publicly issued instrument, one of which is flat out monetary in the sense that it, that it is subject, that according, you know, pursuant to legal tender law, people have to accept dollar bills in payment. So they're guaranteed to be monetary. But then the treasury issuances are almost as monetary because as some of you guys know, treasury securities are often used as a kind of money in the capital markets. And furthermore, they're so instantly liquidatable. That's to say they're so instantly convertible into dollar bills that they might as well be money. They have a high degree of what some people, some hipsters call moneyness, um, second only to you know, Fed notes themselves, right? Now, so what that means is, you know, treasury securities on the one hand and dollar bills and, and their bank account equivalents on the other hand, these are the public liabilities that sort of correspond to all of these public assets. But these liabilities take a sort of primitive form at this point, right? They're still paper and they're still bank accounts. And when they're bank accounts, they're on the private sector side, they are ultimately nevertheless Fed liabilities because the Fed stands behind all of these bank accounts. And the Fed furthermore guarantees that bank account money counts as money by basically administering the national payments system pursuant to which bank money counts in payment, right? So if Alexandra, who's up at the top of my screen, you know, takes a bank card over to Dwayne Reed across, or takes it, let's say, over to Eunice, who's also on my screen, uh, takes, you know, let's say Eunice owns a store, he's a proprietor, and Alexandra swipes a bank card uh, in Eunice's store to pay him, the machine set counts. It's, oh yeah, payment has gone through. But it's not sort of magic, right? There's, it, it's sort of a black box to all appearances. But basically, this is because the little box that she's swiping that thing across or sort of poking it into, if it's a, an insert card, is wired in to a national payments infrastructure, which is administered by the Fed. And that's what determines what counts as payment, right? Now, what, I'm argue, what I argue is sort of plank for the plan is it's really time to kind of modernize or update the national payments infrastructure. Because as you guys know, people are increasingly turning to private sector payment service companies like PayPal and Venmo and the like. And what we see happening then is that basically electronic money is beginning to kind of fragment. And, and of course, this is not even to mention cryptocurrencies and the like. But basically, electronic money is beginning to kind of fragment and look a bit like the private banknotes that used to be the nation's paper money supply in the 19th century, before there was any federally issued greenback dollar, right? So what I'm arguing, okay, is it's time to sort of replicate in the digital space what we did in the paper space back in the 1860s, which was to establish then a system of national banks that issued a common paper currency called the greenback, obviously the antecedent of the current green dollar bill. It's time to do the same thing digitally. And the way I suggest that we do this is once again, one more time, tweaking an existing institution. And so this will be the, sort of the closing point. Almost nobody seems to know this, but anybody who wants to, any citizen or legal resident or business here in the United States that wants to, can open an account right now. Any, any of you guys can do it tonight after we talk, if you like. You go to the, a treasury website called Treasury Direct. You just Google Treasury Direct and you'll go, it'll be your first hit. It'll be the top of the list. It'll take you immediately to this Treasury Direct website and you can open an account with Treasury in, you know, from which you can purchase Treasury securities and into which you can redeem Treasury securities. All you need is a name, a social security number or its equivalent, like a green card number or some other, some equivalent sort of government provided or government issued number or identification, and then a bank account because arbitrarily you can't hold Fed money in your treasury account. You can't hold dollars. So if you're going to redeem some of your treasuries in through your treasury direct account, you're going to sell them to your, you know, out of your treasury direct account. 
And then the treasury is going to pay you by making an electronic deposit of Fed money into your bank account. Now, what I suggest then is, you know, it's really easy. It would be very easy to tweak this thing into a national system of universally accessible digital wallets, essentially a national savings and payments platform. So what we would do is, first of all, allow anybody to open one of these accounts. We already allow that. Second of all, add horizontal connectivity between these accounts to add, you know, add that to the current vertical connectivity between these accounts on the one hand and the treasury on the other, right? So that now I could transact, if I open this account, I can transact not only with the treasury department, but also with Julio, with John, with Eunice, with Medina, with Lewis, with Aruba, all of you guys, we can transact sort of horizontally. In other words, we have, P we have P2P or peer-to-peer -peer connectivity between these accounts and relatedly convert the accounts to digital wallets, right? To sort of iPhone, accessible digital wallets. What we would be able to do then if we once we put that network in place, and by the way, let me just note that US Digital Service, which is another really cool federal agency, basically it just updates the sort of technolo the technologies used by the entire federal government on a regular basis. Uh, USDS in, tells me that it would only take them a couple of months to do that kind of conversion. In other words, before this summer, every legal resident of the United States and every citizen and every small business could have a digital wallet administered by Treasury Direct. And if once, if once we put that in place, there's all kinds of enormous advantages that would come of that, some of which connect up with the first three planks of the plan, but others of which are just independent, just to rattle off a few of the independent ones. First of all, of course, you know, so, you know, say goodbye to the problem of the unbanked or the underbanked, right? The FDIC estimates that about 25% of Americans either have no banking account at all or are underbanked in the sense that they get only minimal banking services. That would just disappear. In other words, financial inclusion, which is arguably a social justice concern, could be met, right? And indeed, in a commercial republic, as we claim to be, or in an exchange economy, as we also claim to be, it would seem to me that a payments infrastructure should be thought of as an essential public utility, just like the dollar bill itself is a public utility, right? When we paid in paper, we had a public utility, we had public money, right? Paper money. Insofar as we go digital, seems like we ought to have a publicly provided digital money then, a digital dollar that would be administered over the system, right? Secondly, um, when you think in terms of growth, you know, basically economic growth, as you guys know, one factor, one determinant factor, uh, one determinant of, of growth is the so-called velocity or the turnover, the circulation, the churn of money. The easier payments are to make, in other words, and the more rapid clearing and settling is, is done, the more transaction volume you can have. And since we measure growth, GDP, simply as a measure of transaction volume, you're almost talking about greater economic growth by definition here. Thirdly, you can encrypt um, the payment information associated with people's transactions and thereby protect financial privacy in a way that these private providers at, at present don't seem to do the best of all possible jobs uh, with. Uh, and then finally, just for the moment, again, this, these are all sort of orthogonal advantages. You know, these, these are sort of independent of the three other planks of the plan. I'll, I'll, I'll bring those in in a minute. But finally, um, think about how much easier and how much more effective and leak proof monetary policy uh, could become, right? If we ultimately migrated this system over to the Fed and integrated into the Fed, integrated it into the Fed's monetary policy apparatus, well now, instead of having to work through middleman institutions, right, trying to boost the money supply or lower interest rates by, you know, Fed you know, basically making more money available to banks or by buying treasury securities from banks, it could simply directly extend credit to individuals through their wallets. Indeed, we could do helicopter drops into people's wallets, or we could do UBI right into people's wallets. Similarly, um, it would be much easier uh, to sort of quickly slow down growth in the event that the money supply is growing so rapidly that inflationary pressures emerge. Just offer interest on the wallets and then raise the interest rates on those wallets in order to induce people to save more if it looks like we want to slow down spending. In a pinch, you could even impound some of the wallet money, sort of in the way uh, J.M. Keynes proposed in this How to Pay for the War monograph during the Second World War. 
I don't think we'd ever have to do that because inflation doesn't seem to be a serious problem in the in the near excuse me near term future. But and so interest rate policy would probably be enough. But um, it would be possible to do that, right? So it would be yet another advantage of doing this. But now to kind of connect it back up to this first three planks of the plan, if let's say uh, a regional Fed bank is you know says okay yeah we'll make money available to this small business or this small family farm or whatever. It can simply, with a few keystrokes, just deposit the money in the recipient's wallets, right? If the Fed is lending money uh, to Alexandra or Olivia or Tomas or Zane or Edgar, I'm just running through names on my screen here, or Joshua or Janice, if the Fed is going to, you know, extend credit to to, to your businesses uh, pursuant to this revitalized regional Fed capacity that Plank Three of the plan uh, advocates. It simply credits your wallets, right? There it is, right? It's just that quick and that easy, right? Similarly, um, if the Fed is going to purchase some of the issuances of the FFB or the FFB's special purpose vehicles, and I mentioned other plank two of the plan, it can simply credit um, accounts that those FFBs have in return for claims on those accounts, whether they be equity claims debt claims or hybrid claims, right? Basically, the, the, you can see what this is all getting at. In a sense, what you, all you're doing is you're, you're basically fixing up or modernizing the national payments infrastructure over which credit is extended as well as uh, purchasing being made um, in a way that basically uh, rationalizes and um, effectuates and, and, and renders much more efficiently operative any other sort of public financing plan or program that you're operating with in addition to providing a much better and more usable infrastructure without fees um, to just private sector commerce in general. So in that sense, I think a plank four is kind of completing the plan in a beautiful way that makes it all work even better, even if it's not strictly speaking necessary to do any one plank in order for the other three planks to be worth doing, or even any more than it's necessary for the other three planks to be necessary to make any one of the planks worth worth doing. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, I'm sorry I went on so long. I hope it wasn't totally uh, tedious. As you can tell, I get I'm kind of excited about this stuff. I'm sort of enthused about it. So um, and so I, I talk too much. <laughs> so, but anyway, I'll shut up now. Um, and it, I, I'm completely at you guys' disposal for as long as you can stand me for a Q and A or back and forth. I, I think we should we should have a few uh, uh, questions and answers. If you feel shy about opening your mic and uh, stating your question, you can just type it in the chat facility. Uh, just to kick start the Q and A, <clears throat> let me ask uh, Robert: um, uh, What kind of feedback has have you received from the political class? Oh, great question. So quite a bit of good feedback, um, actually, uh, somewhat to my surprise. Um, in one sense, it's surprising, and in one other sense, it's, it's not. I, the one sense in which it's not surprising is, 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 is that, as you probably know, Julio, and I know Olivia knows as well, um, I do a lot of uh, consulting work um, with various progressive members of Congress, uh, as well as with various federal agencies, and then with state governments and local governments as well. And on the federal side, um, I'm probably most closely associated uh, with AOC over on the House uh, because I helped with the drafting of the Green New Deal resolution. And then I've done a bunch of follow-up legislative work for AOC sort of in connection with the Green New Deal, but also in connection with some other plans uh, that she has, which are amazing. Um, and then on the Senate side, I've done most of my work for Bernie Sanders uh, and for Elizabeth Warren, uh, but I've done a fair bit for Chuck Schumer and for uh, Kirsten Gillibrand and for a number of other senators and some other House members as well. So in that sense, it's not surprising because I have a kind of access, I guess you could say. But the sense in which it is very surprising is that, remember, this is Joe Biden, right? This is the Biden administration. And nobody expected, even as recently as a year ago, at this time last year, I don't think anybody expected um, the sort of Bernie Krat, uh, Warrenite, AOC wing of the Democratic Party to be nearly as influential in or listened to as much in a Biden administration as it has turned out to be. And so I have to say sort of hats off uh, to President Biden, who seems really to have meant it when he said back in the early summer that he wanted to bring back together a kind of synthesis of the progressive wing of the party on the one hand with the more sort of mainstream or moderate wing on the other. 
And so in consequence, it's kind of looking as though this administration is going to be the most progressive in decades and maybe the most progressive ever. It's, it's, it's jury will, is, you know, still way out on that. We'll, we'll have to see what happens going forward. But it looks as though President Biden is serious about being as transformative a president as FDR was. And he could end up being even more uh, transformative. And that's reflected both in a lot of his cabinet picks and other administrative picks, not in all of them, obviously by any means, but in many of them, and in the particular policy initiatives and policy commitments that he's already taken and made respectively, right? So, you know, he's talking trillions in public investment. Uh, and he's talking about serious structural change. And he's thinking in terms not only of renewing our infrastructural base, but also of renewing our industrial base. And he's doing it with a view to green uh, energy as well. That's one of the reasons I, I think of uh, building back better as a kind of rebranding of the Green New Deal. So he seems to be serious about all of this. And so this very plan um, I have on good authority is, is on the desk of his chief of staff, Ron Klain, uh, and is also, I know, being looked at by other cabinet officials because I've talked to them. Uh, and this was another amazing thing, you know, as you know, in the transition period, after winning the election in November, uh, but before taking office on January 20th, um, the president established all of these agents, what they were, they were called agency review committees, basically just groups of experts to look over existing federal agencies with a view to what we might add to their mandates or their structures or their operations to make them function better and to render them sort of optimal instruments or instrumentalities for the realization of the Building Back Better plan. And so there was a Fed committee, uh, there was a Treasury committee, there's an EPA committee, multiple such uh, review committees. And I was astonished when their memberships were named um, in November, because it turned out I knew something like 25 people on these uh, committees and, and as friends, right, as people I was sort of simpatico with and, and basically allied with. And that too, totally threw me for a loop. I didn't expect that at all. I thought, well, I'll probably know a couple of these people and they'll probably know me in a way that tells them not to listen to, to the likes of me. But it turned out to be entirely easy uh, to meet up with and talk with lots of them in advance. And they didn't, you know, kind of, you know, do a double take or kind of give me the, the incredulous stare um, when I proposed precisely what I've just proposed to you guys. Um, rather, they all seem quite intrigued. So while, you know, anything goes as far, you know, the ultimate form taken by what the administration does is sort of anyone's guess, my guess is that it's gonna look at least somewhat like this plan, even if it's not precisely this plan. I naturally think that the closer it is to this plan, the better, but it'll, it'll be a reasonable approximation, I think, uh, no matter what. So in that sense, it's kind of, you know, I've never been so encouraged. And uh, I've also never, I never expected to be anywhere near this encouraged at any point in my life. I thought I will die um, probably still wishing that, um, you know, uh, development was thought of as a national project again. Um, <laughs> but I don't think I will, you know, I think it's gonna be much better than that um, by the time my days are done. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, like, first of all, like great presentation, uh, Professor Hockett. Thank you. Uh, when you were talking about the national development strategy, um, and well, I had like two questions, but I think you answered one. The first one was like, who will provide the funding? And then you said the FFB. Mm -hmm. So when you have like this program like this, it's trying to rebuild like uh, the existing branches of like you, or what you were talking about. And then like this existing branches are going to, um, get funding or investment into new industries to so they can grow rapidly so i was thinking um would this potentially uh create like a monopoly within, within these industries by like the um national development strategy funding and giving like funding to particularly uh i don't know big companies in itself and by allow by giving them more funding and at the same time giving them like more power within like regulations, would this create like a monopoly or what, what is your point? Yeah, no, that's a great, really great question, Louis. Um, I think that um, that could happen, right? If we didn't act to prevent it from happening, right? But it's, it's very easy uh, to prevent it from happening and indeed to do it, you know, quite proactively, right? So it could be a working principle, for example, that when we decide that we're gonna jumpstart a particular industry um, or we're going to try to encourage or facilitate or foster the sort of further development of certain industries, 
a working or an operative principle in doing that is we could say we're not going to in invest in any one particular company um, and we're not going to invest even in just three companies that we're going to do we're going to invest in multiple companies right so that we can sort of foster um, useful competition as well um, in addition um, i think we should avoid um, sort of focusing the expenditures on any one particular region of the country. Indeed, I would sort of be inclined to exercise um, something akin to what uh, Catholic social thought refers to as the preferential option for the poor. Um, it wouldn't have to be couched exactly like that, but you might say, let's exercise a preferential option, at least at the front end, uh, in favor of those regions of the country or those places in the country that are currently most behind, right? In order, and, and so basically on the theory that, well, look, ultimately we, we want to sort of jumpstart um, productive and non-inflationary growth everywhere. But at the front end, we get a lot more bang for the buck in doing that if we start with the areas that are most behind or most backward or have the most catching up to do. So for example, if you're talking about environmental abatement um, and uh, sort of restoration of particular areas of the country that used to be uh, flourishing but are now not, you might look to Detroit, uh, Wayne County, uh, Michigan, for example, where cleanup is itself going to give you a lot more bang for the buck because there's just so much more to clean. But in addition, uh, productive investments that re-employ people are going to give you a lot more bang for the buck because the unemployment rates are just so high and the, the rate of economic dysfunction and, and, and uh, economic exclusion, uh, including financial and banking exclusion, those rates are so high there that if you start there, you'll show massive results much more quickly than if you start someplace where people are just sort of marginally behind and not fully behind. Now, I, I hasten to add, that doesn't mean I would never want to say we're only going to do that. Um, I don't, you know, in my view, we, we ought to follow something like the New Deal's uh, own playbook, which was to have uh, New Deal projects underway in literally every congressional district of the country, right? There wasn't a single congressional district that didn't have New Deal projects in it. And that was, you know, both politically savvy and justice consistent, right? And democracy consistent, right? It's the justice reason is kind of obvious. If this thing is sort of a national project and everybody is part of it, well, then everybody ought to benefit from it. But it also enjoys the virtue of being uh, sort of adding to the sort of political uh, popularity and, and hence stability and sustainability of, of, of the New Deal, because even Republicans kind of liked it when they saw their constituents benefiting. So um, I tend to think that we've got to do that again, right? We want, we want there to be building back better projects everywhere in every district of the country for justice reasons and for political stability reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, insofar as you have to sequence things and sort of you do first things first and second things second, um, that doesn't rule out starting with the areas where you get the most bang for the buck to begin with, which is precisely, which is going to be precisely the areas that are most disadvantaged. And because those are spread, right, because those are diffuse across the entire country, that means in turn um, that, you know, you're going to kind of have to be investing in lots of different companies. Um, and hence, you know, thereby avoiding monopoly, at least as a sort of continental uh, concern. But then we can go further than that and even locally um, act against or at least not encourage the development of local monopolies either by saying that, you know, uh, a battery uh, fund or, you know, elect, you know, electric vehicle battery manufacturing capacity is not only going to be sort of jump started in lots of different regions of the country, but will basically provide, uh, you know, low cost credit or maybe even direct equity investments in multiple battery producing firms in particular regions to see, you know, maybe some come up with uh, more efficient ways of doing what they do than others, and then they end up kind of winning out. Um, but I, th I think that's what we would want to do. We would basically say, you know, the, the sort of short playing version of this or the summary version, I think, Luis, would be to say that as long as we're being proactive already by publicly investing now and not just sitting back and letting the private sector do everything, as long as we're being proactive, well, we might as well be proactive in a way that's consistent with, uh, with social justice, consistent with even development and consistent with the avoidance of the arrogation of market power by any particular private sector concern, i.e. we can pursue competition policy at the same time that we're pursuing development policy. Is, it, is that responsive? Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> 
Of course, you bet. Thanks. Great question. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? Open your microphone. You wish to ask a question? Well, <clears throat> I have one. Okay. Uh, the the plan is U.S. center. Yeah. Naturally, U.S. center, right? It's to be processed through the institutions, the political institutions of the U.S. Yeah. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, to the extent that it incorporates what we could call the Green, Green, uh, Green New Deal priorities, mm -hmm. uh, there is something in it for the rest of the world. But what else is there in it for the rest of the world? Great. Um, so I think there are a few things, right? Um, some of the universals, you might say, that um, receive sort of specific institutional embodiments in the US context, but would presumably receive different institutional embodiments in other national contexts are one, um, the formulation of a kind of integrated national development strategy for one thing, right? A kind of, you're looking at the economy as a whole and you're asking, okay, what should be, what needs encouragement? What industries of tomorrow need some kind of collective action style or collectively determined uh, fostering or facilitation. Um, and in the US, that might mean then using a council that comprises the heads of different cabinet level agencies that are part of the executive branch of our government. But in other countries, it might, with, with different institutional uh, heritages or institutional traditions, it might make more sense to do that through something like the Ministry of Trade and Industry in, in, in Japan. Uh, as you know, Japan, um, in Japan, the, the sort of the executive power is really something that sort of exists within the legislative power, right? The prime minister, likewise with other most other parliamentary systems, of course, um, the prime minister is on the one hand, a sort of executive, but is also a kind of agent of the parliament or the, or the legislature. Uh, and so, you know, if you don't have a sort of separate executive branch and president with his or her own cabinet, you'd have to, you know, the, the sort of council equivalent would have to be done differently. It would either be some kind of uh, uh, a combination of existing agencies that do or authorities that do these kinds of things in that country, whether they do it under parliamentary authority or under something else, or it might be some freestanding sort of plenary development institution like MITI uh, in Japan, right? Or MITI's equivalent in, in Korea. Um, so that would be one uh, example. Uh, another example, um, the idea of making uh, credit available or making sure that there's adequate low cost credit available to sort of smaller firms and sort of startup companies and startup industries and family scale agricultural and so forth. Well, some countries just might not care. First off, some countries just might not care about that. It might not be part of the kind of national heritage or the, the national sort of objective function or, or, or what have you, in which case that's sort of not a thing and we don't have to worry about it in those other countries. On the other hand, some countries do value that. Um, uh, France, of course, values sort of small uh, family agricultural concerns. Japan does as well. Uh, lots of Latin American countries, of course, have on the one hand, big sort of hacienda agriculture, but also sort of smaller scale agriculture operating in the interstices. Um, any uh, national culture that involves some role for sort of smaller scale uh, industry and agriculture like that might very well then want to do some kind of uh, sort of, again, credit allocative stuff of the kind that I'm advocating that our Fed do. But no, as far as I know, most other countries don't have a sort of decentralized federated central bank of the, of the kind that our Fed system is. Um, and so they would presumably have to do that somewhat differently if they were going to do that. One way would be to have their central banks open branch offices in various regions of their countries. To some extent, I think some central banks already do that. Uh, Germany has a sort of an interesting relation between or, or sort of arrangement between the Bundesbank on the one hand uh, and the various Landesbanken, uh, which are sort of localized, as you know, on the other hand. Um, so it, actually, interestingly enough, our own uh, sort of one of the inspirations or one of the ins one of the helpful models that our, own, that our Fed's own founders uh, used uh, about 100 years ago, 1913, was the German system, right? Because Paul Warburg, who was one of the designers, 
of our system was a German immigrant who'd come to America from Germany after having been a banker in Germany, then became a banker here. But in any event, um, so Germany could probably do something a bit like what I'm advocating here, although Germany probably doesn't have to because Germany all, already does an exquisite job in its own ways of getting credit out to, um, you know, sort of disseminated widely. Um, but basically, um, different countries that have different sort of central banking traditions or modalities uh, would do that kind of credit dispersal function, presumably through different institutional means or through augmentation of their existing central banks along lines that facilitate it. Um, but basically, it, it does seem that most countries, um, A, do view development as something that has to be proactively pursued, unlike the United States um, until now, uh, or unlike the United States, let's say for the last 50 years or so. Um, and so most of them do have some kind of institutional structure, it seems to be, through which to do these sorts of things. And so insofar as that's the case, their primary task, I, I suppose, is mainly just to figure out how to use those instrumentalities to facilitate as rapid a transition as possible with minimal dislocation of a, of a, of a dangerous kind uh, toward green energy sources. Um, but they, they seem to have that, those sorts of capacities in ways that we don't. And so ironically, um, the United States is probably the, the world's poster child for underdeveloped country. Um, we're probably the most underdeveloped in this particular sense. Um, that's to say our state capacity um, seems to, you know, now to, to, to be predicated on a, on a worldview that just doesn't even view development as something that's forever, let alone something that you collectively take charge of and then manage. Um, but once we do that, we have instrumentalities that are, as I hope I've succeeded in, in arguing, um, that are readily adaptable to doing it. Um, and other countries happily, I don't think are as institutionally atrophied you might say, as we are when it comes to acting proactively to develop. So for them, the main task is reconceiving developments along green lines in a way that, you know, development didn't have to be conceived before it became clear uh, that, you know, the world has a sort of a carbon limit, um, you know. So in that sense, I, you know, I think most of our peer nations are advantaged uh, relative to us, you know, because as you know, I mean, the intellectual error is, is much harder uh, to correct, I think, than the institutional error. You know, once you get the intellectual uh, backdrop right, it's not that difficult to sort of imagine ways to sort of um, realize the revised vision uh, through institutional means. And if you already have the institutions and the vision, as most other countries seem to have, it's kind of easier. With us, we lack the vision, and then our institutions are currently configured in a way that reflects the backward vision. Uh, but once we update the vision, I think it's not that difficult to update the institutions. And that's sort of what the plan is sort of trying to do, and, and hopefully, you know, sort of convincingly or plausibly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your plan and being so persuasive and all that. I hope we'll mark you to market, you know, your, your <laughs> Good. claims about the response from the from the politicians, but uh, uh, thank you. I wanna thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and generously giving your time here. Um, and uh, I, I will post, I posted a link to an article that uh, Robert published in Forbes magazine that spells out uh, the plan. And you're gonna see, you're gonna recognize some of these features. And I prolong this a little bit, but it's gonna be uh, recorded and it's gonna be posted on YouTube and, and the link will be shared with, all, with you all, okay? Oh, that's Thanks so very wonderful. much for staying. I know that some of you had classes and all that. Appreciate your, everybody's time. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna open, open your microphone so that we can applaud. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you guys so much. And um, feel free also, anybody interested, just feel free to